Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining the Jira Workflows Primer webinar. We're recording this session so that we can submit a link and, to the recording and we'll post it on our website over the next few days. As you have questions, please be sure to provide them in the questions utility in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll queue them up and answer them towards the end of the session. On the phone today, there are a few of us from Precipio Consulting. Uh, we've got Christopher Pepe. Christopher heads up our last in practice and is the brains behind this webinar. Uh, he's been working with Atlassian Products since 2004. I'm Christian Lane, uh, founder of Pacific Consulting. Also on the webinar is Shayla Sander. Shayla helps coordinate the webinars, amongst many other business development activities. We've been Atlassian Expert Partners for five years and became one of four U.S. Enterprise Expert Partners in October 2012. Uh, these days, 100% of our projects are Atlassian related. We have over 100 clients across the U.S. Uh, and some in Canada, ranging from 20-person uh, companies to Fortune 20 companies, across many industries, including technology, automotive, electric utilities, commercial arts, oil and gas, publishing, uh, and so on. We support our clients in all facets of the Austin product suite and have built methodologies and solutions across the entire product suite. Uh, solutions architecting and implementations, licensing, installs, hosting, training, uh, everything at Atlassian uh, is what we do. So let's turn things over to Christopher Pepe now. He's gonna lead us through the webinar. Thank you, Christian. So good morning, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about workflows. Um, we're going to cover as much stuff as we can, but there's kind of, you know, we could we could do this all day, every day for a week and still not cover everything. Um, but I wanted to start off with uh, one of the Atlassian um, documentation pages. So this is available to you if you just go to Atlassian's JIRA documentation. Uh, we're going to try to cover a lot of the stuff that's on this page. Uh, but we're going to spend most of our time actually in JIRA looking at workflows and, and how they actually operate to give you a base level of understanding so that when you go off to customize your own workflows, you have a better idea of what things are available to you. Um, so to start off with the basic workflow concepts, uh, really what drew us to JIRA uh, in the first place really is the workflow engine that's in it. Um, those of you that know us know that we are a very process-oriented company. Um, and, and really what we like about JIRA is the ability to customize our workflows, to control who can do what within the workflows, to capture a number of different metrics as some entity moves through its life cycle, and then the ability to report off of that uh, at a later date. So for all of those things, um, JIRA is still our favorite of all of the ticketing systems and workflow systems that we have, uh, have worked with. So let's start by looking at what a workflow actually is. Um, at its core, a workflow is really just a state diagram. We have a number of different states that are called steps. So here we have open, in progress, resolved, and so on. We have each of these different steps, and each of these encapsulates some idea within our, uh, within our business process, or within our process. Uh, and then we want to be able to move from state to state. So the way that we get from one state to another state is called a transition. So here, from open, in order to get over to in progress, I would follow this start progress transition. So as long as there is an arrow that goes from one state to another state, we can move through all of our different uh, all of our different steps. Now just a, a little aside, while we have each of these is called a step within the JIRA workflow, and that step is linked to a status, your step names and your status names can differ, um, although we generally don't like to do that. We like to keep the step name and the status name the same because when you go to do your reporting, you're going to report off of the status name itself and it can confuse things if those are out of sync. Um, if you really want to have different names, a, a Greenhopper Rapid Board is a good place to do that. Uh, then you can say, you know, our definition of to do is open and reopened, our definition of done is resolved and closed. You can do that mapping there. In the workflow itself, uh, we at least think most of the time it's best to keep the step name and the status name the same. So one of the important things when you're designing a workflow is ensuring that each of these steps that's in your workflow actually has some meaning within your, within your, uh, your workflow. The default JIRA workflow, which is what we're looking at here, is actually a pretty good generic workflow for most cases, whether you are running a service desk and you're managing incidents, um, or you're doing a, a software development task, um, or if you're a digital ad agency and you are going through an approval process to approve some uh, some graphic that was created, 
this workflow is a is a really great starting place and really fits a lot of different uh, a lot of different needs. So when a ticket's first created, it starts off in the open state. Then when someone takes ownership of it and begins to work on it, they move it into in progress. And then when they're done with it, they can resolve the ticket. And then from there, again, kind of depending on your definition of what done is, um, it can either be automatically closed or maybe resolved and closed mean the same thing. Um, in that case, then resolved and closed are redundant, and you're kind of better off pulling one of those statuses out. The typical use case for it in like a software development or a service desk environment is um, I put in a, a trouble ticket. My password for this website doesn't work. Christian can then pick up that ticket and start progress on it and begin working on it. He can go reset my password. Then he can resolve the ticket and tell me, okay, I'm done. I've reset your password. Go ahead and check. And then if I can log in, I can either do nothing and the ticket will be automatically closed at a later date if that's something that we set up in JIRA, or I could go in and close the ticket. And again, I'd be doing that by executing these transitions to move from resolved to closed. Um, if I still can't log in, I still have a problem, then I can reopen the ticket and say, nope, still got a problem, I still can't log in, please look at it. Christian, Christian can then take the ticket back into in progress, or if he's busy on something else and Shayla is available, she can take that and start working on it and help me figure out, well, actually, it's my account is locked and that's why I can't get in, or whatever the problem is, we can work back and forth. Now at a later date, we can go back and look at all the tickets that we've resolved in the past, and we can look at ones that have been reopened, ones that have had to be reworked. So rework is a really expensive thing. We don't want to ever do rework. Um, and if we are doing rework, we want to investigate why are we doing it and what can we do to avoid that in the future. So that's, again, just one of the reasons we really like the JIRA workflows because it allows, as an actual individual doing work, it allows you to manage your tasks so you know what you're working on, what you still have to do, what's been done. Um, as a manager, it allows you to know what your team is doing. Um, with either filters or rapid boards or anything like that, you can quickly glance at a whole set of issues and see what's being worked on, what's left to be done. Um, and then at a later date, you can come back in and report off all of your historical data and pull information out of it, either if you need to be audited for SAS 70 or something like that, um, or if you just want to figure out how can we improve our processes and, and cut out more of the waste and be more efficient, you can go back and mine all that historical data and the JIRA workflows, as long as they're set up well and they're well thought out, you can go back and get a lot of valuable information out of them. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the actual transitions themselves because in a JIRA workflow, you have all of your different states and you can report off all of those, but how you get from state to state is those transitions. And where you get a lot of your real power in a JIRA workflow is by configuring how those transitions work. So how each of these uh, transitions actually manifest themselves, let's look at, uh, I think we'll actually be reopened in our example, but let's look at open because they're analogous to so really the same thing. From our open status, we can go to start progress, or we can click on start progress, and that will take us to our in progress status. We can resolve a ticket to go to our resolve state, or we can close a ticket to go to our closed state. From open, we cannot go to reopened. There's no transition that will take us from here to here, so you can't get there from here. In the JIRA workflow, um, you can really go anywhere from anywhere. And in progress, you can go to open, resolved, or closed, and so on. Um, depending on what the needs of your workflow are, if you want to be able to control the flow um, through specific steps, uh, then you can create transitions that only go to a step and then transitions only come out of that step so you have to go through a particular place and then we can put other rules on the transitions themselves to control who is allowed to do that. So if you have a development process and you want to approve work before it actually gets into a developer's backlog, we can limit our transitions so that only certain people are allowed to execute those transitions to approve work for development. Now if we go look at an actual ticket, how the workflow manifests itself, is through these buttons right here. These are our workflow buttons. So we're in our open state on this ticket. So we have start progress, uh, resolve issue, and close issue as options, what we can do from here. Here we have subtasks. We can also access the, uh, the workflow options through the, the little gear action menu that's available in the issue navigator, as subtasks, and a few other places, some of our dashboard gadgets and things like that. So we can access our workflow from there as well. Um, 
I want to jump over into the administrative mode now so that we can look at. We're going to look at everything in our text-based editor. There's also the graphical workflow editor, and there are some nuances between um, this text-based and the diagram-based workflow editing. But for the things that I want to show you, I think we can see them a little bit more easily here. So we're in the open state in this ticket that we're looking at here, and we have start progress, resolve issue, and close issue as our available transitions. And each of those transitions go to a particular place. So start progress takes us to end progress. If I click on this transition, we can now see all the different things that are available to us. Um, we have a transition view, and we have conditions, validators, and post functions. And so we'll go through all of these things and talk about what they are and what we can use them for. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the transition view. So we are looking at our start progress transition. If I click on start progress to begin progress on this ticket, you can see I have a screen that pops up. So in order for me to actually start progress, I need to give JIRA more information. That's controlled by our transition view. So here we're looking at our workflow screen. So I'll pull that up as well. We can see on our workflow screen, we have assignee and project manager. So here back on our ticket, here we have assignee, project manager. We also have comment. Now I didn't put comment on the screen. It just automatically shows up on every single transition screen. So you can use this as just a checkpoint, a kind of did you really mean to click this button, or you can use it to pick up additional metrics. So as we are moving a ticket through its life cycle, we can pick up additional metrics along the way. This is just a uh, user picker custom field that we added in. So now we have a, uh, a project, uh, project manager that gets associated to this ticket. Now here we have project manager being displayed over here because it's a person. If it was a, a date that we were picking up, it would be shown down here, or other custom fields would be shown over here in our uh, details section. Um, that will bring us to screens, which is a little bit of an aside, but hopefully we'll get to cover that as well. I think that we'll have time. So one of the things that we do with our workflows is we pick up metrics. So as a, as a ticket moves through its life cycle, in this case, we have a, uh, a user story. So as this user story is moving through its development cycle, we're going to pick up additional metrics along the way. If we have a, a longer kind of waterfall type workflow, we may want to pick up um, you know, unit tests or manual scripts that were run during QA, um, screenshots during user acceptance testing, things like that. That way we have these metrics later on to go back to and look at, okay, what actually happened in this particular step? Uh, and especially if something went wrong, it's nice to be able to go back and analyze all of those things that, that changed. Again, an aside, but I'm sure you're already aware of the history. This is a transactional history of everything that's ever happened to the ticket. So as it moves through its life cycle, as uh, field values get changed, they all get captured here. Um, and, and again, because we do a lot of SAS 70 and other um, other type of certification work like that. Um, these are the types of features in JIRA that make it an excellent tool for getting those sort of accreditations because of all that transactional history. Nothing is really ever lost. All right, so when we click on a button, our workflow screen will pop up. That allows us to collect additional metrics so that we can um, continue to pick up that information as we move through the, uh, through the life cycle. All we have to do to get additional metrics or to remove metrics is modify our screen. I know I'm clicking around a lot of different tabs here, so hopefully I'm not losing you too much. But again, we're looking at our start progress transition, and here's our transition view, our workflow screen. We can change this to a different screen, or by clicking on this, it'll take us to the screen itself. And we can add or remove fields from it. So I can remove project manager. Now we'll just be assigning um, the ticket to somebody when we start progress on it. Similarly, I can edit this transition, and I can pick uh, no view for this transition. So if I do that, then our transition will happen instantaneously. So because this is a, uh, a workflow, we have to create drafts, modify drafts, and then publish them. So here I'll go and publish this draft, and that will make it active. So now my project is actually using this modification that we just made. So if I stop progress, and start progress, you'll see that instead of a screen popping up asking me for a project manager and assignee, the transition will just happen automatically. 
this is nice, especially if you use rapid boards a lot for things where you don't really need to pick up any more information. Really, all you need to do is just change the state to say this, this ticket has moved forward one step in its life cycle. So now here we are in, in progress and we're continuing to move forward. Um, as far as presenting this information goes, just by adding project manager to our transition screen doesn't necessarily mean it's going to show up um, in our ticket view itself. Again, this is outside of the workflow itself, but there is kind of a grander scheme of things that all have to come together in order for the project to operate the way that you want it to operate. So if we go back and look at our project configuration, here we're looking at our workflows tab, but we have to have the correct issue types, we have to have the correct screens and all these other things in place in order for all the right fields to pop up and everything to show up in the right place. So to get the project manager to show up here, what we have to do is make sure that that field is added to our view screen. So JIRA has three different operations in the screens themselves. These are defined in our screen schemes. We have a create issue, uh, create issue, edit issue, and view issue operation. So when I click on the create issue button, from there it's going to make me go through this instead of popping it up. But a series of fields are presented to us. This is what our create um, issue operation screen is going to control. If we're looking at a ticket and we edit it, this is what the edit operation is going to control. So when you create a ticket and when you edit a ticket, you can have a different set of fields that are associated with it. Now again, that's not specifically part of the workflow engine, but it's very closely related to it. If you're going to be picking up metrics along the way, like project manager, then in your edit screen, you're probably going to want to have all of those fields available so you can modify them if you need to. But when you create the ticket, you don't necessarily know what all those other fields are going to be, so you don't want to include them when a ticket's created. One important thing to note there is that all of our required fields, like issue type and summary, any other fields that we have customized to be required in our project definition, um, all fields that have to be required all fields that are required have to be defined when a ticket's created. So if you have a required field that you want to pick up somewhere along in your workflow, it has to already have a value, which generally means that required fields need to be on your create screen. Uh, and then finally we have the, the view screen, which doesn't look like the other two. This is actually the view screen that we're looking at here. So for things like project manager, in order to get that to show up when we're viewing a ticket, it has to be on our view screen. If I went and removed project manager from our view screen, it would no longer show up here. System fields are a little bit different, type and priority and, and versions and all those things. They show up regardless of whether they're on your view screen or not. So in order to hide those, like we've, hi we've hid versions in here, in order to do that, you have to use your field configuration. So again, not directly workflows, but it's all very tightly tied together to your project definition itself. So to get the project to act the way you want it to, uh, you need to know how all of these things fit together. All right, so back to workflows. Within a project, we assign a workflow scheme to the project. That's actually the, the object level that gets associated to the project itself. A workflow scheme is made up of workflows, and those workflows are mapped to particular issue types. So again, within all the administrative things, you have some sort of scheme which typically is going to map an issue type um, to the other entity. In this case, we're looking at workflows. So with screens, we have screen schemes that actually get associated to issue types. So here with our workflows, we have two different workflows that we're using in this project. We have our standard JIRA workflow, except we've removed all the conditions from it. And that's this one. That's being used for stories, bugs, and technical tasks. And then we have this customized workflow called our grooming dev workflow, which is used for epics. This has an extra step in it where um, Epics must be approved for development before they actually will show up in the developer backlog. So before they get to the open state, they go through another intermediate state of approval. So by creating workflow schemes, we can associate different issue types with different workflows. So if we wanted to, every single issue type in our project could have a different workflow, and our subtasks can have different workflows. A lot of times we'll set up our subtasks to just be an open close, a simple thing whereas our stories may have much longer workflows um, and bugs may have their own kind of QA workflow that they go through as well. The, uh, the core of the work itself is done in the workflow itself, though. So right from our project screen, Atlassian's done a lot to make 
workflow management a lot easier and there's actually a lot of things that you can do now directly from the project. We're not really looking at those um, today, but if you have a workflow that's just associated with a single project, you can modify a lot more stuff directly. Things like the workflow scheme, if you wanted to change it, um, and it's shared by a number of different projects, you have to actually make a copy of it, make your modifications to the copy and associate all those back to your projects. Um, but if you're doing a workflow per project, you have a little bit more freedom. But one thing we can always do is edit an existing workflow. When you edit a workflow, what happens is a draft is created, and we can tell we have this little draft tag right here. So we know that we're working on a draft workflow. So any changes that we make to this are not necessarily going to show up to the users. It's, gonna, it's going to uh, be kind of held in this little sandbox until we publish it. Then it's going to be a live active workflow. Now that's different from screens and a lot of the other things that we configure. As soon as we make a change in here, that's automatically going to show up to users. So be aware of the, the things that um, do and don't immediately show up to users and, and understand what you're impacting when you're making changes to workflows and screens and all of those sort of things. Since we're looking at all of our different transitions, I want to take this opportunity to talk about um, how transitions are actually created. You'll notice that uh, in our transition column right here, we have uh, the, the, tra the transition name itself. So what actually shows up on the button when we look at it on our, in our JIRA issue. So here's start progress. That's the, uh, it's not there, but it's right here now. Here's start progress. That's actually the, the copy of the label that shows up. And then it has a database ID of, of four. So we know that that's that transition. Here resolve issue has an ID of five. But down here in our, in our next status, in progress, we have a resolve issue, and it also has an ID of five. That means that this resolve issue transition and this resolve issue transition are exactly the same. If I make a modification to one, it's going to modify both of them. In fact, it's going to modify this one as well, because they're all the same. They're all number five. If you're creating your own workflow, and you're going and adding transitions, and you're adding them in manually like this, when you create your resolve issue workflow here, and your resolve issue transition, excuse me, your resolve issue transition here, they're going to have different IDs and they're actually going to be different transitions. It's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, it just it just is. So you have to, um, there are situations where you would actually want a resolve from open to be different from a resolve from in progress and there are other situations where you'd want them to be the same. If you use the diagram editor, uh, you can reuse transitions much more easily than if you use this text editor. So just be aware of that. There are a couple of other caveats I'm going to try to make sure to point out as we look at the configuration of, uh, of all of these. So going back into our transition itself, we looked at what our transition view will do. There's also a description, and that just ends up being a little tooltip so that as you hover over a button, the tooltip will pop up. So here it says start progress, tooltip. That's because what I put in for my description is tooltip. So when you're creating your own workflows, you're going to want to put in descriptions so that people have an idea what is this transition supposed to do. Um, just as it's important to define all of the steps in your workflow, it's important to have good definitions around all of the transitions that are in your workflow. And then to communicate that information to everybody that's using JIRA. Um, people need to understand what the purpose of each of these statuses is, of each of these transitions are. If they don't understand why they're supposed to be using them, then tickets aren't going to be in the correct state and your reporting is going to be thrown off and it's going to become a, a much less useful um, reporting and task management tool. It's not going to do as good of a job of, of enforcing your process and facilitating your process. So it's important to uh, put in good descriptions and, and do a lot of training around your workflow so people are um, sure of what to do with it. The helicopter flying over me. I'm sorry if you can if you can hear that in the background. So um, the next thing we're going to start to look at is our conditions, validators, and post functions. So now we're starting to get into how can we control our workflow and how can we determine how it's actually going to behave. So we have all of our steps and we have our transitions between them. So we have our general flow set up. Um, but depending on what your role is in a particular project, you may or may not be able to execute all of those transitions. And you can enforce all of that within the workflow itself. Um, there are actually a lot of conditions, validators, and post functions that are available on the marketplace. 
So JIRA has a, a set of them that it comes with, but there are a lot of other ones that tie into external systems that look much more richly at the data that you have within, uh, within JIRA to give you a lot more control over your workflow itself. So I'd encourage you to look at those. And, and if you develop plugins internally, um, all three of these are really simple plugin points that are built into the SDK. They're, they're all really um, relatively simple plugins to write, and they can add a lot of power to your workflow. So let's start off by looking at conditions. What conditions are going to do is uh, they're going to be validated before the issue screen itself actually loads. So again, these are the default ones that come with JIRA. So there's some code committed ones you can tie into, uh, into Crucible. Um, there's only assignee conditions and things like that. So only the assignee is allowed to, uh, to execute this transition. Let me look. So here we'll change the assignee to someone besides me. So let's put on a condition that says only the assignee is allowed to execute this transition. Then if I come back, uh, I need to publish it. All right, so only the assignee is allowed to execute the start progress transition now. So if I reload this page, what we'll see is the start progress button is going to disappear. I no longer have the ability to start progress on this ticket because that condition is not met. I am not the assignee of this ticket. If I assign it to myself, now the start progress button is available to me again because that condition has been met. So the, uh, the conditions are going to be validated before, a, uh, before the page loads. It's going to control whether or not the transition buttons are going to be displayed to me. Uh, I also suspect that if you cleverly crafted a URL to actually execute the start progress transition, that you would be denied that because you don't have permission to do it. So that's what our conditions are going to control. They're going to um, stop people from being able to execute particular transitions. So again, using that, a, a new feature request needs to be approved by some board of directors or you know, change advisory council. We can use that to create a choke point in our uh, or a check valve in our workflow so that only people with the, the proper access or the, the proper authority to be approving work for development can actually execute that transition. Next we have validators which are a little bit different uh, and this is one place we're getting them off of the uh, off of the marketplace is, is a good thing to do. By default there's only these two, the permission validator and user permission validator and they're really not going to give us anything more than um, uh, they're, they're a little bit different than our conditions, but usually you can do things better with conditions. It's better to hide a button from a user and not give them the option to click it rather than let them click it and then deny them access to doing it. So here I added a validator that said users must have delete issue permissions to execute this transition. So how, I didn't publish it again. You're supposed to remind me to publish these things. All right, so by having a validator on there, now my start progress button is going to be available to me. And I can click on this and what's going to happen is it's going to give me an error saying that I don't have permission to execute this transition. So you can see in this particular case, it would be better to use a condition so that I didn't have the option to click the button in the first place rather than let me click it and then tell me I'm not allowed to do it. Um, but there are a lot of other ones um, like input validators. So you can pop up a screen and ask for a email address for the, I don't know, for some other thing and then validate is this actually a valid email address and then reject it if it's not a valid email address. Um, th there's a number of other things you can use validators for as well. They can be quite useful but what they're going to do is they're going to be tested at the end of the transition execution to ensure that they're actually valid. So here we'll go and delete that. And then finally, we have post functions. So where conditions and validators um, are, are conditions that need to be met or input that needs to be valid before the transition can occur, what a post function is is after the transition has occurred, these are a bunch of steps that are going to, uh, that are going to be fired off. And before we add our own custom one, there are two things I wanted to point out in here. The very first one is that there is a post function that says the resolution will be cleared. 
Um, this is in most of the transitions in the default Jira workflow. Um, obviously, except for the reopen ones. Uh, no, in the reopen ones, not in the closed ones. So, if you're going to use the Atlassian definition of things, when a ticket is resolved or closed, the resolution needs to be set. So the resolution is fixed, won't fix, incomplete, duplicate, or whatever you customize it to be. So when you go and close a ticket or resolve a ticket, you set that resolution to be some value. Well, if you reopen the ticket, you want to clear it because that ticket's no longer resolved, so we don't want a resolution to be set. So if you're customizing your own workflows, you're going to have to make sure that you add a resolution screen or use a post function to set the resolution value when a ticket is closed. And then when you reopen those tickets, you want to make sure that you clear that resolution. That stuff's not going to be done automatically for you. So you have to explicitly tell Jira, because Jira doesn't know that canceled or closed or resolved are actually terminal states. It doesn't know that that's your definition of done. All it knows is that they're just steps in the workflow. So your definition of done, your definition of open, you need to enforce all of that yourself. And that gives you a lot of freedom um, to have you know, branching, more complicated workflows and have multiple terminal states. Uh, the last one that I wanted to note is that an event is fired. So for every single transition that gets executed, a Java event get, gets fired. And then you have what are called listeners that are built in. The one that you're um, most intimately aware of is the email listener because it couples up with your notification schemes. So all of the things that are in your notification schemes are, are events that get fired in JIRA. So here's the event. An issue is created. An issue is updated. These are some special ones. Uh, what's the one that we're looking at? Work is started on, I believe. Work started on issue. So work started on issue. This event right here gets fired when someone starts progress on a ticket. And then these are our actors that are going to be notified that that occurred. Now you can create your own custom events. So begin process, QA fail. These are custom events that we created. So then in our transitions, we can specify that a different event gets fired. That will cause our notification scheme to then send out emails to, uh, to people to tell them that this custom event was fired. Now, by default, when you're creating your own workflows, a generic event is going to get fired here. A generic issue event is going to get fired. Um, but that's going to happen for every single transition in your customized workflow. So you're, if you want specific people to be notified of a particular event, you're going to want to create your own custom event and then configure your workflow transition to fire that event. Um, listeners are another thing that if you develop plugins, listeners are very easy to write and they're uh, a very powerful way of creating an event-driven um, integration to another system. So by firing a specific issue and then writing a listener that listens for a specific event, um, you can have transitions in your workflow trigger external things. If, uh, if you happen to see our toaster demo that we did a few years ago at South by Southwest, it's a video that's out there on YouTube, that was actually driven by firing a custom event in a transition and then having a listener that listened for that event and then controlled the toaster. So you can integrate into external systems, you can notify people, or you can tie into other parts of JIRA. You could also write a listener that listened for a particular event um, to get fired and then created a subtask or something like that. So really the sky is the limit with these post functions. You can do a lot of integration. They're a really, really powerful part of the workflow. Um, so let's add our own post function here and look at some of the things that we can do by default. We're going to do a assign to current user because what we're doing is starting progress on a ticket. So we're going to say if you're starting progress on a ticket, that must mean that you want to do that work. So we're going to automatically assign that ticket to you when you click on the start progress button. But there's a number of other different things that you can do. We have a Gantt chart plugin installed, so you can um, perform some Gantt date operations. You can notify HipChat if you use that. Webhooks are a really nice, new, powerful part of Jira. So you can fire off a webhook, which is used as a uh, kind of a remote callback to external systems. So you can integrate with external systems without having to write custom code using webhooks. So what we're going to do is assign this ticket to the current user. I'm going to add this to our workflow. Here it is right here. Caveat is they need to be an assignable user. So now I'm going to go and publish this draft. And we'll see that now when we start progress on this, I'm running as uh, Cosmos Basely. The ticket's currently assigned to Elroy. 
So when we start progress on this ticket, we'll see that now it gets, becomes assigned to me. So that's just one of the many different things that you can do with post functions. And just one of the many ways that you can customize your workflows. Now what we didn't get to today is creating your own workflows, adding different steps to them. Um, you can do it right here actually. Let's try to add one. Once you have an actual active workflow, it can be a little bit difficult to add and remove certain things. Jira is going to block you. So things like um, steps with incoming transitions, you can't remove those. Um, steps that have issues that are in that step in the actual project, you're not allowed to delete those out of active workflows. So sometimes you have to play games like copying a workflow, making the changes that you want, and then modifying your workflow scheme to use your new version of the workflow. Um, but usually adding is a safe thing to do. So here we have a canceled state. So we'll go from our open, we'll add a transition to allow us to move to canceled. So we give the transition a name, what's actually going to be displayed. We give it a description so it has a tooltip. We give it a destination step of where does this transition go. It goes from open to somewhere. And we'll just use our resolution screen as an easy way. Another thing we could do is use a post function to automatically set our resolution to canceled. All right, so now we have a new terminal state of canceled. We can get there from open. Here it is right here. So if uh, we publish this workflow, and I reload this, we will see, well, we don't see it. I wonder if I changed the wrong workflow. It's quite possible. Uh, we're in progress. So now we have cancel issue as an op operation available to us as well. Now I can go ahead and cancel this issue. It's going to pull up my resolution screen and ask me for all of this information. Now say I wanted to have cancel be the very first thing that shows up. So I want it to be the very first transition. This will be the, the last little trick that I'll show you and then we'll move over to questions. That is controlled by a, uh, a special value that's built into our workflows. So again, if you're creating them with the diagram creator, um, this little property is going to automatically be set for you. But let's look at star progress to see what it is. If we go and view the properties of this transition, we'll see it has a couple of different things. First off, we have a uh, uh, internationalization and I18N title. So in our language in our language pack, start progress dot title in English translates to um, start progress, and then in Spanish translates to something else. So by doing this, you get internationalization built into your workflow. This ops bar sequence sets the weight of a transition, so it'll set where it show uh, how heavy it is. So the heavier things will go down to the bottom. Right now, start progress is our lightest. Resolve is the next heaviest. Close is the heaviest, and cancel doesn't have a value, so it gets stuck way at the end. So if we go back to our um, our workflow steps. and we go into our cancel issue transition, and we go and set its properties. I set an ops bar sequence value of 10. So now it's the lightest thing, so it will now show up at the, uh, at the very top, the very first button. Publish this again. So it was at the very end because it didn't have an ops bar sequence value. Now it shows up as the very first button and everything gets pushed down one. I could also go in there and set its value to 100. It would be the most heavy thing. It would go back to being at the very end. So this is important to know if you modify your workflows in the future. So you have a number of transitions that are already defined. If you want to add additional transitions, um, then to get them to show up in the correct order that you want them to show up in, you need to set that ops bar sequence property. Um, I would like to stop at this point because I'm expecting a lot of questions. If we don't have a lot of questions, I can just continue to show you other things as well. Hi, Chris. I've got a question from Brian. It says, do workflows help with integration with other plugins that Jira supports, i.e. Bitbucket, Mercurial, etc.? 
Uh, yeah, it, it can. So again, it's going to come down to the level of integration that you want to have and kind of what your definition of each of those steps are. Some organizations will have a QA step, and really all of their QA work is done manually. They have testers that go off, run manual test scripts, and then maybe attach those scripts back to the ticket, but they don't have any real integration between their QA work and the um, and the step itself in JIRA. Um, but other companies want to have tighter integrations. So some of the things that you can do to get those tighter integrations with, say, Fisheye and Crucible, for example, is you can set a condition that you need to have code committed. So uh, if you have a, you know, a bug or a new feature or something like that, that code has to have actually been committed against that before you can resolve a ticket. So to go from the in progress to resolved um, state, code needs to have been committed against that ticket, which means that one of the, uh, now this project doesn't have it, I'd have to switch to a, a different instance of Jira to show it to you, but you know, Bitbucket, Stash, um, if you use the DVCS connector for, for Bitbucket or GitHub, uh, if you're using Fisheye Crucible, those add additional commit tabs over here. They have different names depending on which connector you're using and so on. There's a TFS one as well and other system per force. So this condition will require that code needs to have been committed against that ticket before it could actually be, uh, before the ticket could be transitioned, before this transition could be executed. Similarly, that uh, no open reviews are available. So if you um, created a crucible review against a particular ticket, all those reviews would have to be completed before that ticket could be transitioned or before this particular transition could be executed. Uh, depending on what other systems you are integrating with, there are other conditions that are available on the marketplace. Um, I don't know if there's one for Quality Center necessarily. There is a bridge between Jira and Quality Center, but one example would be that there would be you know, no um, Quality Center tasks open against a particular Jira ticket before you can transition to the next step. So the best examples I can think of off the top of my head are these conditions in the workflows, um, but that's certainly not the, uh, the only limit, the only integration that you can use to another system. So uh, Brian kind of added to the same question on the, the integration piece. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Bamboo? Sure. So with, uh, with Bamboo, you can actually trigger builds from transitions. Um, you can, I believe you can require successful builds. Let's see if that's actually in there or not. So the build's not in here. I'm pretty sure there's a condition you can use that requires a successful build to transition a ticket as well. Is there a, uh, a specific integration you're hoping to do with Bamboo? And I'll give you a minute to type that, that up. Just as a little aside, since we're here as well, another one that people commonly ask for is um, to be able to enforce uh, requirements. This task needs to be done before this task. The way that you do that out of the box with JIRA is you use this subtask blocking condition. So a parent task cannot be transitioned until all of its subtasks are, uh, are closed. Okay, his uh, addition was uh, track. Track is a good question. Um, I don't know offhand. Yeah, we don't want to import. So I don't know offhand. I'd have to dig into that a little bit to uh, to figure it out. Um, but track being open source, um, I haven't looked at it in a long time. But if there's already an API available, it would be a relatively simple piece of work to integrate the two of them together, especially if it was creating a condition or a post function, something like that. You could link the two of them together pretty easily. Um, even if track doesn't have a, uh, an API built into it, we could either build a REST API on top of it, screen scrape, or use any of the other kind of standard tools that are out there to integrate with it. It's been a number of years since I've looked at tracks. So I don't remember what they're doing. Um, I don't know what they're doing these days with it. Okay. Uh, and Brian, if you could, re-ask that last question. Here we go. To trigger build per environment. Okay. So yeah, the, uh, the addition that Brian added to this is uh, to trigger build per environment, i.e. QA staging. Okay, so um, let's see. So 
So there's a number of different knowledge-based articles out there that will go into great detail as to how you actually set these things up depending on what you're actually trying to do. So in this case, this is releasing a version in Jira will kick off a, uh, a bamboo build. Um, if you're trying to do it from track, again, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at what we can do from track. Uh, Bamboo's got a really nice REST API, and basically you use the REST API. You may even be able to use webhooks now in Jira, but all of these different integrations are going to boil down to you use the Bamboo REST API to kick off that build so that when you execute a particular transition in Jira, that will start a particular Bamboo build. Um, there's a lot of other plugin points in Jira that you could use to automate that um, building as well, but since we're focusing on, on workflows, I'm mostly just talking about those particular plugin points. Um, okay. And in that case, mostly executing transitions that we use for these external integrations. So you'd create a post function that uses the Bamboo REST API to, uh, to start a build. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brian. Next question from Paul. What version of Jira is this? Say again? What version of Jira are we demoing here? Oh, this is uh, Jira 6. Let's see what our... Uh, this is 6.03. So slightly newer version out now. I think 6.05 is a, the, the newest I know of. Um, but this is pretty much what it's going to look like. Um, older versions of Jira, really all the workflow stuff that I've shown you has been in Jira since at least Jira 4, probably even the three. So it doesn't even if your instance of Jira is considerably older than, than six, all the workflow stuff that we did today is, is all available to you. Okay. Uh, next question from Patrick. What are the topics you cover in the full course? Uh, we actually go through creating a workflow from scratch. Um, Maybe Christian, can you pull up the syllabus real quick and, and remind me of what the other things that we do are? We go into a lot more depth of the entire project configuration. So all the nuances of creating screens, there's two different types of screens. There's workflow screens and screen scheme schemes, uh, screens, all the different things related to that, how fields um, show up in different places, field configuration to show and hide fields, make them required, um, issue types and issue type screen schemes and how those things apply to the project. So it's really more of a uh, kind of top-down project configuration, how you get a JIRA project to do everything that you want it to do. Okay, I just pulled it up. Give me one moment. So yeah, um, I think you covered most of it, but it's uh, basic workflow concepts, example workflow in real life, JIRA default workflow we kind of talked through, uh, issue resolution, capturing and presenting your data, custom fields, mandatory fields, common workflow configuration mistakes, configuring workflows, transitions, conditions, and post functions, step-by-step -step workflow configuration example, and then, of course, Jira extensions. Right. So in the actual training course, you get a little bit more hands-on. You have a lot more opportunity to ask questions and to uh, get your hand held through actually doing the work. So you would actually do the, you know, do the work itself. It's kind of more of a lesson-based uh, course. Okay. The, uh, the, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I've got another question if you're ready for it. Yep, I'm ready. Uh, and actually, this is, a, this is a pretty easy one here. Uh, please, uh, Holly from Court says, please remind us where this recorded session will live. I think the whole team will benefit from watching this. Uh, yeah, Holly, um, we're going to post this to our website, precipio.com. There's a link on the right, upper right that says webinars. Uh, you can link to that. You can click that, and uh, it'll show you all the webinars we've got going on. And I think Shayla will probably send a, uh, an email to everybody that participated so you can share uh, that link with your teams and colleagues. Thank you for that. And then uh, a new question from Brian. Uh, is there a way to trigger an email to a non-email address as a post function? There is a way to do it. Um, you have to circumvent the JIRA permission architecture so it's you, you should you know do it with caution and, and under that advisement that you are you're circumventing the built-in security of JIRA because you're exposing issue information to a person who doesn't have permission to see it. Um, all of that said yes it's, it's entirely doable. Um, I 
think, let's see, so, well, that wouldn't actually solve your problem for a post function, but we've written post functions to do exactly that. There's a really low level SMTP server object in the, the JIRA API that you can access and you can send an email to anybody. So a common use case there is a, uh, a user who doesn't, you know, so if you're doing support and you only run JIRA internally, people email you an issue that creates a ticket, but it doesn't necessarily set them as the assignee. But you can still get their email address out of the description field. So you would take that, stuff it into a custom field of, you know, originating customer or something like that, and then use that email address in your post function. You know, you go into that custom field, get that email address, and then send your comment or whatever it is to them. But you have to jump through a couple hoops, and you do have to circumvent the built-in security of JIRA to do that. Okay, cool. And a clarifying question or additional from Brian as well is that how about uh, to a JIRA email? Right, so as long as it's a user that JIRA knows about, then you can definitely do it. Um, really the easiest way to do that is to fire a specific event in the workflow and then use your notification scheme to notify um, JIRA users. So as long as it's a JIRA user that has permission to see the ticket and everything else, JIRA will gladly send them an email. So just use events and your notification scheme to handle that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's all the questions we have. So just to close things out, uh, thank you everyone for your participation and uh, for the questions and for joining in. Uh, we'll send out a link again to the webinar uh, once we've got it uh, all edited down and, and cleaned up so you can share it with your colleagues and uh, other folks. Um, we're not going to have a webinar. We typically do webinars every month, um, fourth or fifth of the month or early on like uh, today. But uh, we're going to hold off on September and October. We're doing some preparations for uh, Summit. Um, Christopher and Joseph are both providing Jira Essentials and Confluence Essential training at Summit. So if you're going to Summit, it'll be a good class. Or if you have other folks that are going to Summit, let them know that we'll be, we'll be providing these courses there. Um, and those of you that are going to Summit, we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, look out for us. We'll have a booth. Come by and say hi. If you have any questions or need help with something, we'll be there to answer questions and, uh, and maybe get you some tips and tricks and help you get around whatever challenges you may be facing. Uh, other than that, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and contact us at howdy at Precivia.com. We'd love to help you out with your next project or any kind of challenge that you're facing. Uh, thanks so much and have a good day.